I had a mission and I didn't really care whether I slept at the Waldorf Astoria or I slept on the ground. It did not make any difference to me. My mission was I was going to write songs, sing songs, and I was going to perform and I was going to let the music take me wherever it took me. And by God, when I started writing, it took me all over the world. Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Don McLean's on the show. Don is such an iconic figure in music history that he probably requires no introduction. But for my younger listeners, Don wrote and recorded one of the most instantly recognizable songs in the last 50 years, American Pie. Singing bye, bye, Miss American Pie. Drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry. Them good old boys were drinking whiskey and rye. And singing, this'll be the day that I die. This'll be the day that I die. He also wrote and recorded Vincent, Starry Starry Night. Starry Starry Night. Paint your palette blue and gray Look out on a summer's day With eyes that know the darkness in my soul Don is a Grammy Hall of Fame member, a Songwriter Hall of Fame member, a BBC Lifetime Achievement Award recipient, and his hit American Pie resides in the Library of Congress National Recording Registry. It was also named by the Recording Industry of America as a top five song of the 20th century. To give you a sense of how iconic this song is, other songs in that top five list include Over the Rainbow by Judy Garland, White Christmas by Bing Crosby, and Respect by Aretha Franklin. Don is in good company there. Although Don's been doing this for decades, he's still got a lot going on creatively. His latest album, Still Playing Favorites, was released in October of this year, and he will receive a star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame on February 1st of 2021, along with Jefferson Airplane. In this episode, we of course talk about his journey into music and the origin story of American Pie, but we also talk about his present-day songwriting process, how he collaborates with others, and dive into topics that I did not expect. Don has some interesting takes on politics, technology, where we are creatively when it comes to songwriting, and where we're heading culturally as a society. Don also gets pretty philosophical when talking about mortality and the importance of living your life now, rather than, as Colin Hay from Minute Work sang, waiting for my real life to begin. I don't know if you'll sense it like I did, but I felt a real connection with Don in this chat. Maybe the fact that both of our dads died when they were 56 has something to do with it. I think that type of shared experience, losing a parent before their time, can be a source of connection with others. Needless to say, I really enjoyed talking to Don. And I hope you enjoy hearing about his journey. So let's jump into my chat with Don McLean. Hello? Mr. McLean? This is he. This is Brian Smith from Dream Path Podcast. Okay, nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. Thanks for making time for me. Thank you for taking an interest. Yeah, well, this is a a big year coming up for you, I know, with the 50th anniversary of American Pie. What are you reflecting back on currently as you're coming up on this momentous year of five decades of American Pie, thinking all the way back to 71 and spanning over the last 50 years? Well, I think it's funny because I think back to Tapestry. That's the first album. And that's the most important album I ever made and the hardest one, the, the the one that took the most effort to get released. So that was the beginning of me being on the world stage and looking back from there. And what I think of a lot of times is that basically the most exciting time in my life was from 1960 until 1970. And that's when I was nobody and I was dreaming and working hard and going to college at the same time and busy with goals and plans that only I knew about. And then to see doors open 
as I was getting more toward making that first album, then getting in the studio to do it, writing the songs, getting the acceptance that I had never dreamed I would get, taking one step after another. That was so exciting, I can't tell you, because you're making this happen, you know? And this is the thing, I, I just wish I could transmit this to people, that you have to focus on what you want, and you have to work day and night for it. And really, that is the only thing that separates successful people from people who are not successful, is finding something that you love and that you love to do and working at it day and night. There's nothing else in your life but this. That's how you do it. There's no quick answer to getting to becoming like successful, because even if I had not been a famous artist who made some songs that everybody knows, I still would have been a very good artist who made a lot of records and who could who made a, a living, which is, you know, the hardest part is making a living. Right. Not becoming a millionaire, but making a living. <laughs> so that's that's one. I'm glad you brought that up about the hard work, because that's one of the observations I had and just studying your history from what I could find online is that you put in some years in the cafes and these small venues and um, traveling with other artists, Pete Seeger. Mm -hmm. See, that was all that I was doing between 60 and 70. I was signed at William Morris in 1969, and I began to open in all these major venues with, with rock and roll acts like uh, Ten Wheel Drive and the James Gang and uh, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Laura Nero. I was always on the road in a professional, much bigger way. But before that, I was always an opening act at all these nightclubs everywhere. And at the same time, I was going to college. I wanted to get a degree, which I did get. So I was always busy using my time wisely and not just sitting around the house, you know, and telling my mother, well, you know, I'm a professional, you know, and I'm not doing anything for months after month, you know, living at the house. I wasn't going to do that. Um, I was going to get a degree and I was going to go and do any kind of job I could get. You know, I did birthday parties for little kids. I did, uh, <laughs> I sang in schools. I sang and I did rallies, anti-war rallies all the time. I did civil rights rallies. I did um, just anything and everything in order to sing and, and learn about what was going on and maybe write a song that would mean something. So I, you know, if I sang at a civil rights thing i would sing orphans of wealth which is a song that i written about poverty in america well you know the folks there could understand that you know it wasn't and i love you so this was about poverty right and uh tapestry i would sing if i sang um with seeger you know one of those many 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 outdoor shows that we did that i remember so well in the 60s building up to the the, the launch of the hudson river sloop i would sing tapestry i would sing castles in the air i would sing these kinds of songs so that meant something um this was all breakthrough stuff in those 10 years so that after i made it even though there was a huge explosion i mean from my point of view where i mean you have no idea i mean if i would play a town i'd be on the news that night in 1971 72 i would have women i mean There'd be thousands of them out there. They would meet me. I was going out the door. They'd, they'd faint. <laughs> Just It was that kind of Elvis thing. style, it was, yeah. It was working up to something like that, you know. I experienced that. So the, the, the 10 years that you described between 60 yeah. and 69, mm -hmm. um, you talk about this being the most exciting part of your life where it, yeah. and it sounds like the, the real excitement comes from the possibility that you could it, make a breakthrough. Right. That's right, because, you know, once you're there, you say, oh, well, you're playing Carnegie this week. Uh, geez, we haven't quite sold it out. You know, well, maybe you should do some more interviews, you know. That's that's business. Yeah. And a business takes over most everything. And, and what I tried to do was just say, fuck it. You know, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm going to do these gigs, do the gigs that I want to do and, you know, do interviews that I feel like doing. But I'm not going to go from running away from being a corporate guy, which I did. That's what Castles in the Air is really about. You know, leaving New Rochelle, New York, leaving Larchmont Woods, which is an upper-class 
white suburb where I was born and the, the, the prospect of and the anticipation really of being a person that wore a suit and worked in New York and took a train back and forth, running away from that in order to be another kind of corporate person, which is the rich, you know, the rich, successful music star who is the ambassador of the record company, the ambassador, the promoter, the ambassador of whatever. Oh, sure, you're making a lot of money, but you're still, you're corporate. Yeah. And I, I don't want, I don't want that. And in, in my perception of folks who make it to that level in any industry, whether it's film or music or mm-hmm. art, is that once you reach that level, everybody mm-hmm. wants something from you. Yes. Well, they, they, everybody wants something from you, even at a lower level. I mean, it, it, you know, even if you're, if you, if you break away in any way, shape or form from the norm, people are going to want something from you. Uh, I'm not putting down, you know, highly successful people at all. I, my hat is off to anybody who can really put this business to work for them and make it on a very large scale and stay away from alcohol and drugs and and decadence, which uh, destroyed Elvis Presley, the poster child for the most successful rock and roll star who was destroyed by all the evil elements out there. And he knew better because he was a Christian and a gospel singer. Mm -hmm. So how did you manage to stay away or did you manage to stay away from those? Oh yeah, I I stayed away. Well, I have, um, I was a swimmer. You know, and when I was younger, and 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 let's say in the late fifties, early sixties, I was on a swimming team, which was at a a country club called Orienta Beach Club in uh, in Mamaroneck, New York, and um, we were state, we were county champions, uh, and in those summer months, we would have meets against all the other uh, clubs that really were there for swimming. Swimming or tennis, but mostly swimming. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I was re- I respected my body, and I wanted to challenge myself to do things. I didn't want to hurt myself with this stuff. You know, it was to me it was it was bad enough that I smoked in high school and I have asthma. I had to quit that thirty five years ago, and I'm so thankful that I did because I wouldn't be alive now if I hadn't. But we used to do a thing, and I'll tell you that I've said this before. And but we used to do it at the end of the summer. We would do a thing called the rock swim and only anybody could do this. And it was probably a, a big old rock ledge. that was like two miles out in the sound and they take you out by boat. And then you stand on this rock, maybe 50 people and they shoot a gun off and you'd see who could make it into the shore. And it was a bitch. I'm telling you, I mean, it was a long, long, long way, a long haul. I remember digging in and doing this and thinking, Jesus, I'm going to drown, you know, (laughs) and making it, you know, and thinking, well, when I'm out on a lot of these tours, you know, and it gets tough, I said, fuck it, I'm going to make it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I don't turn around and go home. I mean, I was three years ago, my girlfriend and I, we were together. If I hadn't been with her, I wouldn't have made it. We, we were on this long two month tour in the UK and in, and in Europe. And I got terrible bronchitis. And I had I had seen three sets of doctors. I was, uh, you know, on all kinds of medication. I sang every night, and uh, that was it. I'm, you know, I, that's what it bred that in me. So I value my body and uh, and keeping myself healthy. And I know a lot of things about how to stay healthy on the road, what to stay away from, what to be all right with, and so on. You know, and one of the things I I don't take drugs or pills. I don't have any, I'm 75. I don't have any illnesses. I don't take anything. Wow. That's amazing. So going back to the sixties, the 1960s decade, that was so formative for you. Yeah. It sounds like you were so immersed in the culture at that time. And you're playing these rallies and these, uh, these protests and these cafes. Did your firsthand immersive experience in what was happening on the streets inform your songwriting process yes. in the seventies? Yes, it definitely did. And, and let me just tell you a quick little story and then we can talk more about that. I was brought up in a very white, very upper class 
uh, upper middle class society. Everybody lived in a beautiful house and we all went to beautiful schools and the, everybody was well dressed and civilized and there was no crime. And I mean, it was just like what you would imagine the 50s would be only much better. It wasn't Levittown. You know, these were there were Tudor mansions and smaller houses. It was a very interesting place that I grew up. When I dropped out of school and started singing in my first nightclub, I stayed at the Hotel Earl in Greenwich Village. And I remember I was so scared and kind of alone. And I opened the window and there was a brick wall was about six inches away from my hand. That's how close the building was to the next building. There was no, <laughs> there was no, there was a brick wall right in the, where the window was. Right. And then next to me were two old guys who were talking about shooting heroin. Hmm. You could see them through the door. So this is what I descended into from where I came from quickly. Uh -huh. And I just thought it was disgusting, but I had a mission and I didn't really care whether it was, whether I slept at the uh, Waldorf Astoria or I slept on the ground. It did not make any difference to me. My mission was I was going to write songs, sing songs, and I was going to perform and I was going to let the music take me wherever it took me. And by God, when I started writing, it took me all over the world. You know, my songs are played in every country on earth. It's a really interesting story because it has nothing to do with wanting to be a star. God. It had to do with the mission that I had. I, I love that concept. And I've talked about that with a lot of guests on my show about how they got where they are isn't because they chased something. In, in other words, they, their end goal is not success or stardom. It is the creation. It's, it's the journey. And as cliche as that sounds, you know, it's the journey, not the destination. But I think that's a, that's a common denominator with a lot of folks that I talk to who have made it into, quote unquote, success in whatever industry they're in. Well, it had been so exciting up to that point, you see, because this is 1964 when that happened with the Hotel Earl and all. But I had had a circuitous route where I ended up making an audio tape and sending it to Harold Leventhal by hooker by crook that's a whole story right there i can't even get into it here but he was the manager of the weavers and seeger and judy collins and alan arkin and all these really classy left of center artists you know that i admired and they were what i wanted and he his office called me at my when i was with my mother and said we want you to come to new york we'd like to work with you now that is how i got into show business it's a long story uh, I started by calling the Weavers when I was 15 and then making this tape and so on and working my way slowly through the years. I got out of high school, I got in, you know, and then I quit school. And then suddenly uh, I, I, I got a call from them saying they, they would like to represent me. So that's how I got showcases in New York at the Gaslight and the Bitter End and these places that were legendary places to me. I was scared to death. <laughs> Everything I did scared me to death. You know, flying scared me. Being, you know, in every job that had opening up for, you know, Steppenwolf scared me. You know, you go on stage, they want to eat you alive, man. You know, it's so interesting that you came from a place of affluence and privilege, and you still dove right into doing the hard work and you well, know, getting in there. It's because, of, it's because of my father dying. He died when I was 15, and I had a premonition that he was going to die, and he died. Uh. And he died just like in front of me almost. Uh. And we had nothing after he died because he, you know, used every penny very wisely. He was not, we didn't have extra money. There were no savings. Oh, so you were just and surrounded so, by affluence, but you weren't necessarily wealthy. That's right. right. Okay. That's right. Uh, and so I was suddenly at 15, the boss, my mother was hysterical. So she couldn't do anything. And I was the one telling her what to do when I was 15 years old. In fact, I was the one who called the police and the ambulance when my father was sick and he told me, don't do that. And I said, I'm doing it. And he died four hours later. Mm. So I was, I, was, I, I was in charge. And from that point on, nobody ever told me what to do because I wouldn't hear it. Right. Yeah, I knew what I wanted to do and I was going to do it. And I saw how that man, my father, who I loved, worked himself to death you know for this uh company uh, it was a utility actually consolidated edison 
two weeks a year, whoopee, he gets off, you know, and it's over before it starts and he gets to work in his garden somewhere or, or have a couple of cookouts in the summer. And that was it. Back to work, you know. And I'm saying, man, I am never doing this. And I discovered, you know, acts like Josh White, who was free and easy, and Pete Seeger, who had his banjo on his back and did what he wanted to do and made it up as he went along. I said, that's for me. Mm. You know, I want to make, I want to be Woody Guthrie. I want to make it up and go, and I don't care. Be, I want to be a romantic figure. That's what I want to be. I don't want to be a cog in somebody else's wheel. Right. And and you became acutely aware of your own, everyone's mortality when you witnessed your father passing away so young. And That's absolutely right. And life life is so short, and, and there you That's go. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely right. Get on with it, man. Yeah. You know, get on with it and do it because... And then forget about benefits and forget about, you know, biding your time till you're 65. Screw that. <laughs> you know, no kidding. screw that. I mean, that is just the worst. And that's the majority of people out there. You have people on welfare who are waiting for a check in the mail. All this talent we have, black and white, sitting alone, doing drugs, waiting for money for nothing. Instead of having uh, be up against it. And what am I going to do about this? How am I going to figure out how to do something to make a living? Mm. That's how you get somewhere when you're going to fall, you know, and you don't have a safety net. I had no safety net. And that's that's it. So you've got them over there. Then you've got the trust fund people on the other side, the rich brats, you know, who have mom and dad always taking care of them. And what kind of country is that? Yeah. You know, and then you've got middle and the people who are working in the middle and they're waiting for to die and get benefits that they won't even make it until because my dad was 56. I mean, you know, he had 10 more years to go. <laughs> yeah. My dad died at 56 as well. Well, that's tough, man. Yeah. You know, I'm it's too young. Yeah. But I mean, you see, you see each segment of society with very few exceptions are living off of something else. They're not living off. They're not swimming. They're not on that rock swim. Yeah. They're, they're waiting to live instead of just <laughs> I know. getting down to it. Like you say, we can't have that. You know, that's not, a, that shouldn't be American. You know, you should, you should be imagining things to do. That's, that's so inspiring. I'm glad that you talked about that because I, I think we all have those, those sort of existential dilemmas and thoughts throughout our life because it's a grind. Everything we do is a grind and the corporate world and, you know, the con I know. conventional vocational world is, is a grind. And hey, Sitting home and doing drugs and, and getting welfare is a grind. Yeah. How am I going to score the money to get this shit? Right. You know, I, all this stuff is, rather than saying to yourself, and they don't have the direction, you see, of, of good teachers to tell them this, uh, and it doesn't matter where they're, what, what social strata they may be at, they don't have the direction of the right teacher to tell them, you know, everything is going to be hard. There's no easy way. The, the only way to real satisfaction is accomplishment. And setting goals for yourself, small steps, like like I say, in the 60s, it happened for me. Suddenly, there I was, you know, right where I wanted to be because I kept pushing at it, you know. And finally, there I am in the Leventhal office in 1964. And there I am, you know, doing these guest appearances and little things, little small stuff and having a lot of rejection, too. Boy, you got to get ready for that. You know, a lot of rejection. I heard Tapestry you, got rejected 72 times. Well, it was like 30 sometimes, but it was at least, it was every time hurt, and I was $20,000 in debt right off the bat, and back in 1969, that was serious money. Mm -hmm. And you could buy, you know, five uh, automobiles for that. But I, fa I, I found a manager, a, a guy who was this crazy guy who found a, um, in the 60s, who was, and this is one of the guys I worked with, and he used to get quarters back from a, uh, a, a telephone booth that returned quarters. <laughs> Are you talking and about he, Herb he Gart? Would, yeah, Herb Gart. He'd be in that place all day, putting the same quarter in, making these calls to people. <laughs> he, But he appreciated what I was doing, and we talked a lot, and I learned a lot. And I stayed with this guy a long time, and he just couldn't adapt, and he couldn't, he couldn't work with my success. And so he became a... Uh, detriment to my success and um, and still I stayed with him way longer than I should have uh, and then money got stolen and that was the end of that 
So what, what types of, uh, what types of mistakes, when you look back on your career, what types of mistakes do you think, well, you know, I'm kind of glad that that happened because if it hadn't happened, I wouldn't yeah. be here versus the kind of mistakes yeah. that you, w- you really wish you could go back in time and change. Gee, you know, I don't know how to answer that because I, I kind of feel like, um, you know, in bus stop, um, the cowboy that takes Marilyn away, he says, uh, I don't care what you did, you know, as long as you, you know, you are who you are, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I really, it comes down to that. If you're happy where you are and you didn't kill somebody or you didn't rob somebody, or you didn't commit some sort of a horrible injustice to another human being, you just maybe could have gone a different direction. Well, who knows where that would have led? I mean, if I had done something different, I might've got killed, you know, in an airplane or something. Right. Everything had to work out for me to be alive now. I have terrific life. And, you know, certainly you're not going to have your life work out like a storybook. But again, that was never my life to begin with. My life has always been a lone wolf. I've always been a lone wolf. And, um, you know, I've settled down for a while. I had a first marriage and a second marriage 30 years. And that that blew up. But I perfectly comfortable being a lone wolf because that's what I am. So I've, I've noticed in looking at your career, there's a, there are circles of people that you performed with and wrote with and hung out with, but I, I didn't see, if this was a Venn diagram, I didn't see a, a crossover with uh, Bob Dylan. Did you run into Bob Dylan or were you influenced by him? Because you, you kind of... Yes, I, I was influenced by the Beatles and Bob Dylan uh, in the early years, in those years in the 1960s. Everybody was. Right. You had to be. And his use of language was uh, stunning, and I loved it. And I'd never heard that before. And But I will still stack up a good Irving Berlin song, which is a beautiful little mosaic of, of very small small words used beautifully. A song like, not this isn't Berlin song, but a song like The Way You Look Tonight, a song like that, a beautiful melody and song like that, against any Bob Dylan song. Hmm. (laughs) I'll have to check out Irving Berlin. I haven't really listened to him. Well, that isn't a Berlin song, but The Way You Look Tonight is, and any of those songs, that those beautiful songs, uh, they're so simple, but they're little, perfect little worlds, you know, that uh, melodically, and, you know, like I sang a song, on the album uh, Botanical Gardens. The last song on it is a song I did not write. It's a song called Last Night When We Were Young. And that was written by, I think, Jerome Kern. Oh, my God, what a beautiful song. What a beautiful idea. Last night when we were young, love was a star, a song unsung. Life was so new, so real, so right, ages ago last night do you know how life can change overnight Mm -hmm. from some world that we had it happen to the whole country with this pandemic right it just happened the next day the world we knew was over and last night we were younger then now we're older fighting this thing wearing masks you know scared of each other all this stuff Mm -hmm. that's what this song is brilliant you know Timeless. Today, the, today the world is old. You flew away, and time grew cold. Where is that star that shone so bright ages ago last night? Mm. Wow. As you may have noticed, there are great resources and advice mentioned in all our episodes, and for many of them, we actually collect all of these resources for you in one easy place: our newsletter. You can go to dreampathpod.com slash newsletter to join. It's not fancy, just an email about each week's episode, featured artists, and resources to help you on your journey. Now, back to the interview. So, you mentioned when I, we were talking off mic that you used this time to record some new songs and you're working on some new songs. Right. Uh, what is your recording studio set up and, and where do you write and where do you play and record? Well, I, I'm, I don't do any of that. We say Vip and I work on some lyrics together, right? Mm-hmm. And then we get the lyrics done, and then he sends them to me, and then I do the melody, and I do it into my phone, and I sing with my guitar and sing the song with my melody and our lyrics together. And then I send it to Nashville, and they make a track with my phone a recording of the song with just me and the guitar. 
And that track is usually so good that that's what ends up on the record. Wow. That's how I do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm basically going to have five songs pretty much ready to go, except I got to get the vocals right. And the way that's going to work is we're going to get, um, there's a thing called Garage Band, which you can oh, yeah. have on your computer. I have that, yeah. Yeah, well, I got to find out if I do. I have a guy, a really good friend of mine here, who does so many things, and he's my man in the desert, and he'll come over and get that organized, and we'll record those vocals, and that's it. That's it, you know? So what's your personal songwriting process like? I mean, let's let's go back to... Oh, well, that's much more painful. Okay. This is fun. It's easy. I could do this for a lot of songwriters. I know how to make write melodies for anything and make their songs much better. So, you know, I could have collaborators and have another hundreds of songs, but I, I boil it down. But, you know, I've kind of gotten somewhat jammed. I really don't want to write about what I'm seeing out there now. I, I don't, it doesn't turn me on. It doesn't, I don't see anything noble or, or dramatic about what's happening in mm-hmm. the world at all. I see I see a lot of manipulation, a lot of sloganeering, a lot of virtue signaling. You know, everybody's got to prove they're on the right side of things, you know. And mm-hmm. uh, to me, it's at my age, I hate politicians. I hate both parties. And I just wish, you know, that it would all go away. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I really do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think what you're describing is, I think, what the younger generations are feeling as well, which is yeah. this disillusionment about politics in general and the lack of a third party. And if you vote third party, you're somehow you're, you're pro Trump uh, because. Uh, yes, I know. I know. I get this from my left wing friends. And I'm an independent, by the way, but I get my. They say, oh, Ralph Nader, you helped, and even his own people said you helped elect George Bush. Well, you have the option of not voting for him. Right. Okay. <laughs> it's really a question of power and consolidation of power, and and that has to do with what the squeaky wheel gets the grease in America. Right. So if Asians were more vocal, we'd have Asian Lives Matter, you know, written on the road. You know, and we'd we'd be playing paying reparations to them for all the slavery and hardship we caused them in this country building the West. If India lives matter, you know, American Indian lives, we'd have that printed somewhere. But they're not making the noise because they've got casinos and lots of money. So and Asians have been assimilated. So it's all, you know, the ones that that make the most noise. I mean, God, that if Jewish folks were really up in arms, they'd They'd be picketing IBM, you know, for having James Watson give Hitler a computer programming so he could, you know, log in every every Jew that he killed, you know, in World War II, which he did. Hmm. So, I mean, there's, there are atrocities all over the place. You know, it just depends on what organization is 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 up and running, you know, and, and well, well healed with the right language and the right uh, weapons. It's interesting that you you talk about the the lack of inspiration that you're feeling and seeing in the culture today versus uh, you know let's contrast that with what was happening in the '60s. What was happening in the '60s and '70s that lent itself to such rich a, a rich songwriting environment where these songs were not just pop hits, but they were cultural game changers. Well, I think first of all they were teaching the they were teaching liberal arts in the colleges, you know. They were mm-hmm. teaching people were graduating with English degrees or they were learning they were reading, they were literate. Colleges are corporate, nothing but vocational schools if you ask me, for people to be uh good with a computer. Right. And and move around a lot of useless information. So so back then you're you're thinking that the art the more arts well-rounded education that was provided to students uh, created a, a richer yeah, but you culture see, you environment. Just, but, but you can't pluck that out of there because it's all part of who we were as a people back then. Mm-hmm. We, valued, we valued the arts much more than business. Business degree in college where I went to school was the low man's degree. Science and liberal arts were the things that all the smart kids studied. Hmm. But business ended up being the thing that Iona College is known for. We have heads of unions and heads of 
NBC and heads of all sorts of different corporations that that graduated from the master's program at Iona College. They've taken over the colleges and they've they're the ones that endow them with this enormous amounts of money. And then and then we get kids saddled with enormous amounts of money who spend the rest of their life trying to pay it back for an education that isn't worth anything and for a job they can't hardly get. They're always changing jobs now. It's not like you have one for the rest of your life. We were different people then. You know, we had tradition. We had things that mattered. Now everything is splintered and um, there's 500 television stations with nothing on them or reruns from the 60s or 50s. You know, the rest of it's Jim Baker, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, Larry King's prostate report and, you know, all this bullshit. (laughs) So it's, you know... (laughs) I mean, we're a different country. We had three three television stations. Most of them showed, you know, Western themes, which were morality plays. At Christmas time, you had a week of solemn uh, Christian pageantry in on all the major morning shows. They'd go to Rome, or they'd go to you know some place where they were having pageantry having to do with Christmas. First of all, we're not a white country anymore. We're not a Christian country anymore. So it's just tragic. Total different. And what does that mean? I don't know what it means, but it means that you're not going to get the same kind of language, the same kind of attention to melodies and all the rest of it that you're going to get with what we have now. What we have now is Kanye West and people like that who won many Grammys who I don't understand a single thing they do. And maybe I'm not supposed to. It's not my world anymore. I accept that. I, again, I'm flexible about this stuff. But I think there is still a yearning for beauty. Hmm. You know, and I think that's why they, there's a lot of stuff. But it's not going to come back. That's the one thing you got to remember. That stuff that I was a part of or that you're referring to will never come back. There'll never be a big band era again. There'll never be an, an American Pie again. There'll never be an Elvis Presley or a Beatles again. It's never going to happen. Right. And it shouldn't the biggest, happen. Because it can't happen. Right. Because the society that produced it is gone. The biggest thing out there is Ed Sheeran. Can you say that again? You broke up. You said the biggest thing out there is what? Ed Sheeran. Ah, uh, yeah. And he's, he writes nice songs, and he sings by himself, and he managed to organize himself and use the internet in a way to make the biggest tour that ever was in the last last year and it'll probably be the biggest tour for many years because no many that not that many people are ever going to get together again mm. that's so, so so sad and profound but 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 that's sad. not bob dylan you see right i mean listen to the songs of bob dylan uh and this is not to put any kind of negative spin on any other artist because i like ed sheeran very much and i like and i'm very proud of him and i'm in awe of what he has accomplished um, I, I mean, we, we we did a benefit together. It's on YouTube. You can see it. And we sang Vincent together uh, for a bunch of people raising money for teen cancer awareness. It's uh, um, Roger Daltrey's foundation. And the next day, wearing the same clothes, you know, his shorts and his checkered shirt, he played to 90,000 people at the Rose Bowl. <laughs> 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 and I said to him, I said, you know, Ed, you got to retire. Right. And he did. He did? <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, you know, he said he's not going to do a tour for a couple of years. He's going to take, you know, be with his family and all this stuff. And then this pandemic hits. There's never going to be a tour to top that one. Not for years and years. Can't be. Yeah. I, I watched an Ed Sheeran documentary on Apple, Apple TV, and it was uh, quite impressive how young he is. He, well, he's smart a as a whip, you know, prodigy. and uh, he's brilliant and he's smart and he's hardworking and he's a very down to earth, lovely person and uh, God bless him, you know, but the stuff we you're talking about that's more densely literate and more densely musical is not going to come back. You're not going to have a big band era again. You're not going to have Al Jolson again. You're not having it. Right. Cause it's, I think what you're saying then, if I'm catching you right, is that whatever game changing cultural defining artists are going to emerge are going to be a product of whatever culture exists at the time. And that's exactly what the song American Pie is based on. Yeah. And the same thing goes for the leaders who run the country. They're going to have the same values. Mm -hmm. That's why they're going to have the same music. It's it. 
it was one of my better ideas because <laughs> it keeps playing out. Yeah. Well, I mean, 50 years later and it's still hitting charts and it's, I think, I think you're right. It, it captures the essence of what was happening in the late sixties, early seventies. So, so let, let me say one more thing about this. Uh, and this is where I go a little South on this. And that is that to me, I spend a lot of time looking at my phone. All right. Mm -hmm. So if I, I lose my, if I lose my phone, I feel like I've lost my wallet or my car keys. I go into panic mode immediately because there's so much stuff on this emails, notes to myself, blah, 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 photographs, you name it. We are seeding over our brains to the telephone. We are, I used to memorize every single phone number. I don't know any of them anymore because I put it on this contact thing. Right. So I'm seeding over my mental strength. I'm not doing the push-ups, the exercise of my brain that I used to do before I had this thing where I would read three newspapers a day and I would do all this stuff. First of all, I can't see, but you know, I, as well as I used to, but, um, in, on a bigger level, the country, the world is seeding over to all these computers, uh, everything. And it's happening. And we are on a, an arc that is what happens with technology is it goes along sort of straight up. Let's take aviation. 1905 or whatever they had the wright brothers the thing is you know just barely doing nothing and then you know world war one happens nothing it's growing world war ii has it and we're starting to have an air war now and we're having an airline industry that it is is in its infancy well then what happens, this, the, the line goes up, and then it makes a bend, and then it takes off. So in the 60s, the airlines just took off, and then we land on the moon. We're taking, then we're using this technology. Boom, it takes off, and we're taking rocket ships now, mm. and we're on the moon. So this is from 1905 to 1969. That's 65 years. That's 10 years younger than me. That happened. Right. So we're now in about the 15th year of this technology thing that we're in the middle of everybody's wired up everything wi-fi is everywhere it hasn't made the turn yet to take off oh well, that's kind of scary but it hasn't <laughs> I've, i'm buying a new kitchen range for example i'm starting to using this time to learn to cook right mm -hmm. i'm loving this and my range is is shot it's very old it came with the house do you know the new range that i'm going to get is a, is a is a ge range it's, it's a monogram range it has Wi-Fi capability. I can start this with my phone while I'm in the car. I can preheat the oven. Oh, my gosh. I don't think I need that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Again, that takes away the fun. Right. Why not preparation in the kitchen and while it's getting going? Instead of, what's the hurry? <laughs> you know, I mean, they did this. Uh, to me, I want to tell you, they did this um, list, you know, this list of the the, the 365 greatest songs of the 20th century. And American Pie was number five, right? Mm -hmm. And the first one was um, Over the Rainbow, and then uh, White this Christmas. Land is your land, White Christmas, uh, Respect, and then Me, okay? Right. Now, I would have put Satisfaction as number one. Mm, okay. That would have been my first choice for the number one song of this 20th century because. Everybody is manipulating useless information and seeking satisfaction. Okay. It's the truest thing ever said in a song. Right. And it's, I think it, what you're saying too, and, and I, I recognize this in social media, how they're manipulating what we like. They're feeding us and I guess shaping our own interests, our okay, consumer well, interests. Okay, well, this is the thing. You know, remember Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message, right? Mm -hmm. The old medium on television was black and white, and there were little plays, and people would do live things on television. They would have special events in 1960, like Peter Pan with Mary Martin, and uh, it was like Broadway. All of a sudden, was on television. Now, the medium of television has morphed into its own delivery system. It is like a a, 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 a heroin-like drug that goes directly to the nervous system through your eyes and your, into your brain. This is not now watching something 
that like 60 years ago was a version of what we see on Broadway or what we would see on the concert stage. It's it, it it's now is like a drug that goes directly to your brain through your eyes and your ears. So that's what's happening with entertainment, uh, with all this stuff. And it's constant and it's everywhere and it's brain numbing. And it is in conjunction with all of this technology and these computers, which if you're not assaulting the brain with this stuff, you're taking the brain's capacity to use itself and giving it over to the human. So that's where we sit now. And we haven't even made the big turn. Right. Also, it's, it's not just the actual messaging and technology is not the drug necessarily. It is part of the drug. But I think what it's doing is it's capitalizing on the dopamine, which is the actual drug being injected yeah. into our brains. Yeah, well, yeah. But you, you see how the original YouTube internet that it started out with is morphing into a, a whole new delivery system where everything is everything is everything, as they used to say in the 60s, which I thought was the stupidest thing anybody ever said. <laughs> but in this case, it's actually true because YouTube, you know, I do an interview, it ends up on YouTube. If I do a this, it ends up on, you know, it's, it's, it's TV, it's radio, it's everything all together. Yeah, I think, I think, well, what's the point of TV? You know, we, I think we all recognize that we have a problem with technology and phones and that we, when we do put them down or we're forced to put them down, yeah, you know, it, it, we feel better, <laughs> we feel better for it and we realize it's good for us, almost like broccoli is. Yeah, right. But um, yeah, I, it's, I don't know that it's ever going to go back to no, I'm a saying situation it's speeding. where- I'm saying it's speeding up. Yeah. I'm saying it hasn't reached its uh, speed yet. Yeah, until those chips get planted in our brain. Maybe that's- Well, that, that's all heading. that nanotechnology is all there, ready to go. When we become machines, I mean, that's going to happen. I'd like to ask you about, not to switch gears too quickly Yeah, no, here, no, but- I'm sorry. I, I Thank you for letting me talk. I, I'm very- um, I'm passionate about this. I see it. Well, the point I wanted to make anyway was that all this stuff, while seemingly pushing us forward, I think is throwing us into a dark age. Mm, okay. No, that's that's uh, indisputable in my opinion. Yeah, that's what I think is happening. I, I mean, I'm 48 years old, so I haven't been on this earth as long as you, but I've never seen a darker time. There you go. Putting aside politics, the politics are, mm-hmm. are dark. I mean, we're in a dark sure. time. But also technologically and, and culturally, I hear you. We we are not connecting with each other. We are we're going you know what we're doing is we're going inwards. I know. Instead of outwards of to our fellow man. That's right. And this pandemic has accelerated though. It's a rabbit and hole. And you know there hasn't been a new car or a new car design or a building design in probably twenty five years. And they keep remaking everything. No innovation. It's, it's just because you, you don't have that, that desire to really de- get deep down and express yourself. And it's all just safety shit, you know, and, um, and all this music is all the same. My girlfriend plays this stuff all the time. And it's like, it's just the same funky, groovy stuff, you know, and some, some nonsense lyric that's repeated over and over again. And um, it's distracting. That's all. It's nice to have in the background if you like that. I love rhythm, so you know I don't mind it at all. But it's it's like ninety percent of the music isn't there. It's just the, the the rhythm section and some guy think saying you know you're so hot you know or whatever he's saying. You know, I've noticed that your tour schedule is actually starting to book on your website. Your twenty twenty two tour schedule and fingers crossed. Yeah. It it seems probably aspirational for all artists to be booking anything at this point. I know, but I refuse to be I refuse to lay down because of this. Right. You know, we're working right right away at this Broadway thing. We're I don't care if it comes out in twenty twenty five. It's gonna happen. What Broadway thing are you talking about? Well I'm doing a uh a documentary movie through a man named Spencer Proffer, who does all this stuff. We're doing a documentary. That's happening. Okay. And then we're doing a children's book. That's happening. Nice. The Broadway show is something that he wants to do, and he has the people that do it. They did the um, Carol King show, hmm. and uh, 
So we're, it was just an article about it in the Wall Street Journal that um, even though Broadway is closed until next May, uh, I told him, well, that's no reason why we should just, you know, lay down and die. I mean, I, we have, we're hot for this. We want to do it. I have the music. I'm alive. We're going to make the book and we're going to you know, have the songs and have it ready to go. Nice. So it's going to be based upon your songs and they're going to be original songs created for the show. There'll be some new, some new songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's pretty exciting. And I think Broadway is going to, it may not be exactly the same, but I think it has to come back. I mean, Broadway is so much part of the fabric of our It's all going to come back. The question is how many theaters can stay empty for a year and a half and not go out of business because they are they have mortgages. So they have a, outrageous taxes in New York City. They have all these people they employ. That's the problem. Is the is the is the uh, I have a finance degree. See, so I love this stuff. Everything is based on the biosphere that surrounds the given endeavor or enterprise. So, <laughs> you know, when you lay off people at a, a, a fine restaurant, you know, those are career waiters and, and chefs and things. They can't be starving at home. They have children. You know, they go find something else to do. You can't put that restaurant back together like it was quickly. Yeah. And that's why they, you can't that's why they that disappear. Talent. Yeah. A lot of restaurants have gone are gone forever, and I think a lot of venues, uh, West Coast and East Coast, and throughout the country, I are know, in jeopardy. I know a lot of these. You know, there are so many. There's like 700 performing arts centers in the United States. I could play these things for a hundred years. All right, a lot of them have been saved by women's groups who've gotten together and they've taken a gorgeous old theater that the town fathers was just slathering, hankering to knock down and put up a parking lot. You know. And they said, no, you're not going to touch this building. And they've moved in there. And like in, in Staten Island, there's a place called the St. George Theater. And it's run by a family of Italian women who've spent, raised money and begged, borrowed, whatever they could do. And they've made this place into a, an ongoing venue. And they, you know, you eat there and they give you their make Italian food for you and everything. And all kinds of great stars play this place. I think about them sometimes right now. What are those ladies going to do? They put so much into this. They have a mortgage. They own the bank money. If they can't book acts in there, you know, I, I, and they are a microcosm. Anyway, I, I'm getting off on this, but it's those people, you know. Yeah. Talk about rapidly changing culture and to lose these iconic venues and all of the folks that were part of those venues that are relying upon that exactly. as their existence. Yeah, exactly. we're, we're looking at a radical transformation of what, exactly. what the entertainment industry looks like and what the restaurant and industry looks like. What the world is going to look like. I mean, right. this is a big deal. Yeah. So I guess, you know, in terms of innovation, you, you're just going to have to, as an artist, a performing artist, innovate and figure out how to reach your, your fans. And that's just going to look differently, but you're still going to do it, it sounds well, like. Well, that's what I'm doing. I yeah. mean, that's why I've been working on this, on this channel and the programming and the and the, ta the the tapes that I make here at the house and all the stuff everybody else is doing too. Uh, I am doing this and it's very successful uh, because I think I have been so under under known, <laughs> if you will, that there's so many things that people know that they want to find out more, and the millions of people are getting things off this every week. Mm -hmm. You have a new album coming out next yes. week, right? Yeah, still playing favorites. Okay. And the the way that you look at album releases today, I imagine, is much different than it was back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Well, I had record stores and vinyl. It was their old record business. Right. So when you release these digitally now, are you also putting out vinyl still, just kind of nostalgically, or is there a real well, market I'll tell for you it? Well, I'll tell you what's happening. The, the, the channel has been so successful, and the relations I have going with uh, this guy, Spencer, has been so successful that Warner Brothers is putting out this album digitally, but they are also going to release all 11 albums in a box set along with the new record. Oh, nice. And then Universal, who owns Capital and who own United Artists, two record labels I have been on, they have called us and said, we want to contribute, want to get in on this 50th anniversary thing. So they're going to put out very likely, I haven't, I'm not sure of that, but they're very hot to put out 
the first six albums that I made for United Artists, which are the most probably important albums I ever made uh, in a box set. So that's also, so there's all kinds of stuff happening. That's really exciting. So when you say box set, you're actually talking about the hard copy vinyl or CD I think box CD, set. yes, CD, CD okay. box set. And it may end up being vinyl too. I don't know. Well, vinyl's really made a comeback over the last oh, I 10 know. years. I know. Yeah. So the Hollywood uh, Walk of Fame. Tell yes. us about that. I, I've heard there's a, a star that's going to be placed that might have your name on it. That's right. That's going to happen on February 1st. That's already locked in. That's so exciting. And Jefferson is. Airplane is going to be there with you? I guess. I don't know. Yeah. What is that? I mean, you you seem like such an intellectual guy who's who's focused on really big, important issues. I'm not issues. really very smart at all, but I just like to think about stuff. I like America. I like watching what's going on. And I don't like slogans. Right. You know? But given your, your worldview and, and what you're paying attention to and what you your values are, what does something like the star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame mean to you? Oh, I love movies. Are you kidding? This is terrific. I'm there with Clark Gable. Are you crazy? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Holy shit. I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> and the same and the same thing. I think I'm going to put um uh Charlie Bird, uh, Charlie um uh, Charlie Parker? Yeah, he's going to be there. I think I'm going to put him in the ground. Nice. Yeah. Oh, this is a beautiful thing, man. This is a beautiful thing. Well, it's a, I'm glad that you're still able to appreciate those types of accolades. Oh, I love show business. Are you yeah. kidding? I wish I were more of I wish I were more of the other kind of person that just was you know, I, I saw Ringo recently on TV, and he was showing this guy how he plays the drums. And he is the coolest, sweetest, nicest guy and the most talented drummer, you know, you'd ever want to see. So soft and swinging and all that. I thought, what a great guy. You know, I wish I had more of that in me. I've got this thing where people think I'm annoyed all the time. <laughs> and, and I'm not really. I'm, but it, I guess it's coming through. I'm thinking about this stuff that's annoying me, but it's coming through me somehow. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's a drag. I'm more like John Lennon, I think. When he was young, you know, he had a big mouth. He was always getting pissed off and stuff. I wasn't quite like that. But a little darker personality. Yeah, a little dark. I wish it, it's a drag because I love people and I appreciate um, I was talking to Joe Piscopo on the radio and, uh, you know who he is. Right? Oh yeah. Comedian. Saturday yeah. Night Live. Yeah. So I was kidding him about his Sinatra impersonation, you know, cause I love Sinatra and I was having a lot of fun with him and he's, we had a great time. I was on a show twice and I was just kidding him. Like, uh, you know, I said, Joe, um, you know, I love your Sinatra impression, but there are a couple of things you got to get, you got to improve on. I said, first of all, I want you to try this out. When you go and you get on stage and you start to sing, I want you to look out at the audience and say, how did all these people get in my room? <laughs> I want you to practice that. Because <laughs> that was like a Joey, Joey Lewis line because he was so drunk. It was about being drunk, drunk beyond belief that, you know, he would think they were all in his room, you know, and whatever. How do you go? How do all these people get in here? That's the first thing. The second thing is whenever you hit a high note, Joe, I want you to put your hand on your side and say, I think I hurt myself. That's another big Vegas thing. Like you got a hernia from the. <laughs> <laughs> he was laughing. He was having a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, Mr. McLean, I, I am so honored to talk to you and to hear your story that is in between the lines. I mean, the, I, I'm, I'm glad that we didn't focus too much on. You know, American Pie and Vincent, which is something you probably yeah, get asked about ad nauseum. But yeah, yeah. Well, we we really went some places that I was not expecting. So thank you for that. Yeah, I, I'm glad. I, I you know, but people uh, at my age now, you know, people uh, want to hear, of course, a little about those songs, but they also, you know, want to know more than that. You know, what was what's going on, and I'm perfectly happy to. Uh, to discuss those things because we live in in such a, a fascinating time right now. I mean, we are, and by the way, they're they're bringing the plague back. They've they've, they've found that they still have viruses that are, that are the plague and and, and smallpox and these stupid laboratories that are around there. You know, are still have this shit. Can you believe it? Oh uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's I know, it really is. It's uh, kind of kind of scary, but if you look at history, it's it's uh -huh. just. Every hundred years, there's a there's a big pandemic, and every 
10 or 12 I, I, years, I, there's a virus that's scary that, you know, you yeah, have to I, deal I, with. I, I wouldn't, I think we're going to have more of this, you know, and I don't think we're out of the woods on this at all. No, this is, I, I agree with you there. This is a lot of weird stuff I'm reading. Anyway, God bless us all. We'll muddle through, I'm sure. And uh, nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. And uh, good luck with your album release and also your uh, star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Thank you. All right. You take care. Bye-bye. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.